Recent political maneuverings in Canada have changed our political options. The traditional idea of Canadian conservatism was lost in 2003 when the so-called Unite the Right movement swamped the old Progressive Conservative Party with the much larger, more radical Alliance Party, which had become the voice of neoconservatism in Canada. Neoconservatism is about changing the balance between the power of government and the power of the marketplace. I mean, there always has to be government because corporations need courts, they, need, they have contracts, they have to have courts, police, uh, force behind the, the contracts they have. It's to make capital uh, liberated from control so that in theory we'll all be better off. The weakening of government means that, and the and starving government by cutting taxes, means that uh, the social programs on which the rest of the public depends are impoverished. So there's a basic clash between those who benefit from being from having lower taxes, basically the, those who have high incomes, and, and, and corporations that don't want to be constrained by having to pay workers too much or pay medical insurance in the United States or, or pensions or all, all the encumbrances that governments have put on business in order to distribute wealth and make it a more equal society. Uh, a lot, there was a lot of pressure from business saying that Keynesianism was failing and a new approach was needed. And so there's a critique of the regime that had actually been very, very successful uh, in Canada, in the United States, in Britain, in Mexico even. Uh, so it was in the 1970s that the, a big shift took place. And the, I guess it was marked by Ma Margaret Thatcher being elected in 1979 in England, and then Ronald Reagan, her buddy, riding into power uh, from California into Washington in 1980. And these, these were two politicians who really believed that markets should be freed up and that they had a, a magic solution to making everybody better off and, and ever, you know, happier ever after. Conservatism is an American import. It's a very radical brand of conservatism. It abandons all of the kind of modesty and sobriety of traditional conservatism. It is, combines really the worst of liberalism with the worst of conservatism. It combines a, a laissez-faire economics of liberalism, unfettered capitalism in other words, with social conservatism. And it's not only a matter of economics, it's not just an emphasis on economics, but for example, the father of neoconservatism, Irving Kristol, uh, is not just an advocate of uh, bourgeois economics, but also of something that he calls the bourgeois ethos. And the bourgeois ethos is a myth that is meant to justify and support the unfettered capitalism of neoconservatism. And that myth is the view that within our own culture, especially North American culture, that we have reached basically a complete and perfect equality of opportunity. And that uh, those, in other words, there is what Crystal says is there is a correspondence between income and talent. So there's a perfect harmony between those two things. So that those who make the highest income also are those who deserve to make the highest income. They have the talent to make the highest income. Whereas those who are at the bottom of the scale are either stupid or lazy or both. So there's absolutely no reason to provide greater equality of opportunity. So liberal conscience is clear now. We don't have to do anything to provide underprivileged children with any more opportunities whatsoever. So with neoconservatism, we have a complete absence sense of noblesse oblige, which was part and parcel of traditional conservatism, which is because you have uh, accidentally, by the accident of birth, been given all sorts of privileges in society. You deserve, you need, you need, or you ought to give something back. Whereas we don't have that concept whatsoever in neoconservatism. It abandons the concept of noblesse oblige. What you have is what you deserve. If the government we have is not any good, we have to have somebody else to throw in to take their place. But the important thing is that we don't have a political system where our differences are, are ideological and extreme, so that when one go a, cha a government changes, half the lives of half the people change, that people are threatened by, by change instead of accepting change. 
as in the, the overall interest of all concerned. And usually the country will reach a consensus when it's time to change governments. And they change. As an immigrant, I was always, I thought Canada was Nirvana because it was a place in which politics didn't matter. Uh, I never voted because, even though I was a political science professor, I never voted because I thought all the political parties were great. They were all fine with me because they were all variants of liberalism. But with the emergence of the Reform Party, there was something menacing on the political scene that was really a profoundly hostile enemy to liberalism. And that was a neoconservative ideology. And that, that's when I became kind of politicized and kind of worried about Canada and about what is happening to Canada. Um, when I was in Calgary, I used to hear Preston Manning a lot give lectures, and he was always talking about how he wants to bring religion into politics, that that was the goal of his whole achievement. And I wondered, what would you, why would you want to? Anyone who wants to do that is suffering from a serious case of historical amnesia, or else they really just want to make Canada into a mirror image of Ireland or the Middle East. There is one reason that offers itself very clearly is that religion makes, might make people more accepting of the inequalities in society. It might make them more accepting of the liberal mythology, of the liberal ethos, of the economic ethos or the bourgeois ethos that someone like Irving Kristol uh, think, is talking about. The society created by neoconservatism is an oligarchy, which is to say it's rule of the rich. And in particular, it's a kind of rewriting of the golden rule, according to which those who have the gold make the rule.